This is The Lonely Office, your playbook for navigating the messy line between work and life. Our topics are sourced from real, anonymous workplace conversations happening within Glassdoor communities, from how to not get fired to negotiating severance. We discuss timely work-life issues so you don't have to brave that professional world alone. What are we talking about today, Aaron? We're talking about Roland. Can I tell you this story? Yeah. Yes, can't wait. Roland had been here before. The first time he got an employer termination notice was in 2021. And Roland didn't sweat it. You see, there was a routine that all terminated professionals were adopting with stunning success. Roland was just going to follow the script. He jaunted over to LinkedIn and he began to pen his ceremonial goodbye post. Oh, man. Well, (laughs) he concluded that post with all good things must come to an end. <laughs> and and yes, Matt, oh and Leia, gosh. it was time for Roland to move on. Well, nice turn of phrase. He wasn't fired. He moved on. It's not you. It's me. It's not you. It's me. Yeah. So within only six hours, he was flooded with job offers in the comment thread. And his DMs nice. were chock full of empathizers handing out jobs at their firm. Well, that was then, 2021. But this is not good old days, good old days. But now we're talking May of 2024 and Roland's situation had drastically changed. He'd been Mm -hmm. out in the cold for six months, no job leads and things were grim. That fail safe routine, you know, the proud ceremonial goodbye post on social media, nothing. He posted it. It was crickets. Ah. So Roland decided that desperate times called for desperate measures and he hunkers over his LinkedIn profile, and he hovers over the open to work status on his profile. Not that, anything but that. He says to himself, has it really come down to this? (laughs) 48 hours later, still no leads. Roland decides to play his final hand. In a long, winding, emotional post, (laughs) <laughs> Roland dishes about his struggles, finding a job. His post was raw. It was cringy and a desperate plea for help. But it seemed to actually strike a chord. The post goes viral, quickly amassing thousands of reactions. It there you worked, go. he thought. Relieved, Roland knew a job offer would be waiting under the heap of comments and DMs. As he started to slowly scroll through them, the stark reality became clear. It was just a trove of well wishes and support emoji (laughs) notifications. Mm. But there was this one comment. It came from a previous report of his. Roland leaned in, hoping to land a pity referral. But instead, the comment read, thoughts and prayers, my friend. (laughs) Thoughts and (laughs) prayers. No. Those goodbye posts on LinkedIn. Do you guys remember those? You could never catch me writing those. Oh, really? Okay. Well, no, I got fired a lot of times. You didn't hear from me. The thing is- Yeah, but I don't think back when you were getting fired, Aaron, it was like a big thing. Right. It it became like a very big- There was definitely- Yeah, that's true. Yeah. At least in the marketing industry, a culture of writing those. And yeah, people would be like, hey, we're hiring. Because I mean, that was the- That was the the golden age of leaving your job and finding something. It was a ritual. Yeah. Honestly, it felt more like the individual was flexing when they posted it than asking for a job That's true. or referral. That's what he read to me. It was like, you know, patting their own mm-hmm. back of sorts, kind of like Roland's story where he was terminated, but no, he's actually moving on. It's a different framing of sorts. I don't blame him. But that's kind of what it felt like. But that it was like a, Yeah, the voice of a LinkedIn generation, right? Yeah, the voice of a younger generation on LinkedIn for sure. But, you know, the other thing that occurred to me too is that whatever happened to hitting up your contacts directly? It seems like the first yeah. go-to is your LinkedIn, but good old email and hitting up your contacts in your portfolio or in your Rolodex. Is that even a word anymore, Rolodex? Maybe it's less. I don't know. I feel like it's almost like people are embarrassed to do that. They'd rather just throw something out into the ether and see if anyone bites. That's the approach these days. Have we lost our contacts, Matt? I mean, I've been remotely working for four years. I think now, at least on the show, it feels like it's been three years. 
Right. I don't think I have any traditional Rolodex anymore. It's just sort of like I jump on a Zoom meeting. I'm in a weird void of communication. I just meet who I meet. It's like a weird abandoned party in some warehouse in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Maybe that's a different story. No, but that's it is a, fair a bit point. bizarre. Yeah. That's a fair point. We're all in our caves of sorts, working remote or semi remote right. or hybrid. It's a lot harder to just keep your contacts fresh. And of course, if they're not fresh and you reach out, it's like, who are you again? Yeah. Think- and then it feels like you're asking me for something and you haven't even. Mm-hmm. I- you didn't even invite me to your baby shower. Didn't invest anything in the relationship. Yeah. yeah. Funny how you call when you need <laughs> something. That's right. Yeah. Right. So, you know, just to kind of kick this off and, you know, the story of Roland, there's a frustration that's building. We talked about this in the previous episode. And uh, I'd like to kick it off with just a few of the lines we heard from posts on Glassdoor and forums like Reddit about how they feel. Expressions like, it feels like a government lie. Is anyone scared this will never end, or I've been out in the cold for six months. These are all expressions being voiced by a generation of Americans, and by a generation, I mean millennials and zeers. For many of us, what we're being told by the government and media about the economy simply doesn't rhyme with what we are seeing ourselves, both in our own job searches and in our social media feeds. Post after post of job hunters complaining that they can't land a job, even after months and months of trying. And it seems like popular media is finally catching on. One week ago, the Wall Street Journal published an article titled, The Robust Market Feels Like a Lie to Job Seekers. In it, they talk about despite the glowing monthly job reports continuing to roll in from the U.S. Department of Labor, that, quote, plenty of workers have rarely, if ever, felt more stuck. And that's the exact scenario Roland, our protagonist, finds himself in. Stuck. Gone are the market conditions of 2021 when he could rely on empathy referrals from LinkedIn connections. The new stark reality Roland finds himself in is not only a new job market, but uncertain head or tailwinds like AI and companies seeking to do more with less. Experiencing today's job market is like unboxing Apple's new Vision Pro headset. Oh, here we go. Is Shiny. this a line only you can relate to, Matt? I don't know. None of us have done that. Shiny and full of potential from the outside. But once you open it, you quickly find out you have no use for it when it comes down to it. And similarly, employers are just passing on candidates. We mentioned on previous episodes the frustration building up within young workers who are being told their skills are not sufficient or their experience is lacking. Certainly, it can't be the job market. Just look at the numbers, they all say. Mm. Well, I think that frustration is starting to reach a tipping point. And what's very telling is that even the most credentialed job seekers, those with advanced graduate degrees from well-known institutions, are also starting to complain. And it seems like, finally, the data may support their story for a change. Dr. Guy Berger director of economic research for the Burning Glass Institute, shared a post recently revealing the unemployment for holders of advanced degrees, particularly MBAs, has in fact been creeping up. Mm. And in other data, unemployment rates for recent graduates is trending higher when compared to the overall workforce. It appears that the narrative is starting to shift. So what exactly are we in? A white collar recession, a rich recession, or is it an overachiever recession? primarily impacting secondary degree earners. Today, we're on with Aaron Tarazis, an economist formerly at U.S. Department of Treasury, then at Zillow, and now chief economist at Glassdoor. Aaron, it's great to have you on. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. I think we've actually had you on a previous episode, but it may- Yeah, we were talking about that. Was that in the pre-Leia era? I don't like (laughs) it. It was pre-Leia era, for sure. (laughs) Yeah, we enjoyed our time. Frankly, we need some domain experts on the show from time to time, so- if for nothing else, just to have you kind of explain a bit what's going on. We have kind of a ritual here of reading a thread from Glassdoor, or sometimes it's a thread from Reddit. And so in this post, the title is, is anyone else just scared? Look, I don't mean to fear monger. I'm actually just looking for a bit of comfort from anyone who is currently going through something similar or has gone through something similar in the past. I've been job hunting since November and I've landed zero interviews since then. I'm a little freaked out. What are my chances of finding a job before June? How are you guys dealing with this? One of the comments here, I have 20 plus years of experience and I'm absolutely worried. But then I have Mm -hmm. children now and a stay-at-home wife. 
being the sole provider financially makes me worried, even during the best of times. And I've been working from home for the last six years. And then the comment right after that, I too have 14 years of experience and haven't been able to get an interview since September. My same resume that got me, got me lots of attention in 2018 got me nothing this time. And he actually says, I even broke down and paid for job scan. I won't give them the benefit of publicity here, but paid for a service to make sure that I was getting through the applicant tracking system. So, you know, these are just a few samples of dozens and dozens that our, our show researcher shared with us today. It's really a palpable fear. I think the benefit of these anecdotes is you can kind of sense what some of these job hunters and seekers are feeling or how they're thinking. And Aaron, from your vantage point, what is it exactly that's going on right now? You know, I, we mentioned the terms Again, white collar recession, is it a rich recession? It just feels like there's different strata of the economy or different workers in the economy maybe feeling different things. I think you're completely right to note this gap between what people are saying that they're feeling and what the data, the, the official data keeps showing. In some ways, I'd say we're on a two-track labor market right now. So sure, the aggregate data the averages show that things are humming along just fine. We had a jobs report last week, a little over a week ago, and you know it was a little bit disappointing, but overall just fine. However, those averages hide two different types of labor markets right now. And, and so, you know, if you are a frontline service worker, if you are a vocational trades worker working in construction, working in food service, you know, you probably just got a big raise. The jobs markets for those type of work are still very tight. If you are a knowledge worker, if you have as you said, a postgraduate degree, it is a very soft jobs market. And so I think that's one of the confusing things right now about the economy. It's not unusual, I don't think, for us to have these gaps between what the data are saying and, and what the people are saying and what anecdotes say. My rule of thumb is that the data are usually lagging, the anecdotes are usually overstated a little bit. And so in reality is somewhere between. Just to be clear, when you say it's soft a bit for the advanced graduate degree workers, what does that really mean? Are they just experiencing more time trying to actually find a job? Are they getting more rejections? It's both. It's advanced degree holders who find themselves laid off. They are spending more and more time in unemployment before they find a new job. For much of early 2023, it was the case where people would lose jobs. There wasn't a big issue. They'd find new jobs relatively quickly. If they were lucky enough to get severance, that usually meant they found a new job and had a new paycheck even before their severance ran out. That's no longer the case. So you see unemployment also ticking up for that group. Mm. Again, even within that category, it tends to mm. be very early career and late career. So you know, people with less than five years of experience are struggling to find entry-level roles. And people with 20 plus years of experience, they're struggling also to find new roles. We mentioned that top Dr. Guy Berger's research. You've done your own research into this a bit, I guess, diving a bit more deeply into the breakdown of kind of these graduate school, secondary degree earners, and who even within that pool are perhaps suffering the most or experiencing the most difficulty getting a job. Can you share a little more about that? Yeah. So the research that I've done looks at the time unemployed after layoff. And if you have less than a bachelor's degree, it's basically below pre-pandemic levels. If you have even a bachelor's degree, it's roughly at pre-pandemic levels. Mm -hmm. If you have a postgraduate degree, it is really increasing very quickly. It's now above pre-pandemic levels, as high as it's been going back to 2012, 2013, at the, the very tail end of the post-Great Recession jobs market. And within that, kind of, we even see different trends based by gender. So men seem to have higher time in unemployment than women if you are a postgraduate degree holder. Oh, we definitely might want to click into that a bit. Um, yeah. On the bachelor degree thing, there was an article recently we mentioned where the Wall Street investment banks mentioned they're going to be reducing their analyst class by two thirds. It was like a leak. Is there anything in the data to indicate otherwise? Like, are there any data points that can be cherry picked to indicate, in <laughs> fact, that, hey, if I'm a bachelor degree student, I'm having a difficult time landing a job. Here's an indicator. There's some forces in the market at play. And it's not just my own skill or talent, because anecdotally, again, at least AI seems to be playing a role in causing companies to hold back on hiring recent grads. AI is a whole kind of additional topic. I think, you know, there's so much speculation right now. Some companies are starting to talk about what that is doing to their hiring plans. But you're right. I think even if in that bachelor's degree category, even if people are able to find new jobs, that doesn't speak to the quality of those new jobs. And so one thing that we've looked okay. at is how satisfied people are in their jobs. And in a lot of these high-skilled professions, 
in tech, in finance, in consulting, you just hear that and you see in Glassdoor reviews that people are more stressed. They're less happy, less secure than they were. Um, there's more job security, anxiety. Don't forget, the, these are kind of generations of people who invested heavily in education, education that they were told was going to pay off. That's right. And suddenly yeah. they're not feeling so sure about that. Okay. And then back to the advanced degree and then the male-female split. So Leah, I know you have an MBA. No, I don't have an MBA. Remember, Am I wrong? I was, You've classified I... yourself as the MBA type before, I think. No. <laughs> so she she I worked at, think... you were admi admissions no. director for MBA, yeah. right? Yeah, MBA admissions. My okay. husband has an MBA. You obviously, at some point at least, were kind of a believer in the degree to pro, to yeah. pro it can land you a job. What's your take now, either via your, your husband or perhaps other friends of yours who pursued MBAs? Are they having difficulty? Interesting piece of data that it's not actually helping. And it's a lot of money to invest in something that's supposed to help with connections and landing a job and giving you that sort of tick mark on your resume if it's not actually. I was at a women in business dinner last night and there were a couple MBAs there who were looking for work. It's a little bit scary uh, to hear. When I'm listening to Roland's story, part of me is like, I don't empathize with this guy at all. I'm not crying a river, like rich session, white collar session. What about just finding a job? However, Matt, when you read that post where that person was concerned because he was the sole provider of a household, then all of a sudden I was like, wait a second, my empathy sort of reopened, not just for Roland. I don't know his circumstances, but for myself, because I'm the sole provider of a household a wife, three kids. And I realize now, wait a second, there is something to be said about a sole provider who has a domino effect. It's not just them, right? I mean, we're talking their family and maybe that fear really is right. legitimate. This is why Aaron T's analysis on the breakdown of male versus female is actually quite insightful because in the post we just shared, he specifically mentioned that his wife, in his case, she was a stay-at-home wife, which means he's a sole breadwinner. Aaron T, can you just share a bit more on that analysis of what you found where it appears that most of the unemployment duration is being driven by not just graduate degree holders, but primarily male graduate degree holders? We did look at what are the differences between long-term unemployed graduate degree holders who are men and women. And the biggest difference that stood out was that unemployed graduate degree holders who are men are older. They're median age, close to 50 whereas for women, it's in their early 40s. And a couple of hypotheses, as I've talked about this research with other economists, is that this is perhaps a result of companies cutting down on their highest cost workers. We know that there's a mm. gender pay gap. And so, you know, there's disproportionate savings to the company from cutting back on their higher paid senior management or upper middle management workers who are disproportionately male because of historic promotion and pay gaps across genders. Perhaps it's the legacy of 20, 30 years ago, when graduate degrees were biased in gender outcomes as well. So this is yeah. a little bit of skill atrophy or historical processes feeding through to the present. Uh, also, a third theory, this is not the right audience for it, since I'm the only woman on the podcast right now, maybe uh, those men are just used to having more handed to them, and Absolutely. they're not trying as hard oh, there you go. Yeah. to get a new there job. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, Stone yeah. Cold Stunner right there. That's Sorry. fair. Don't That's fair. Stunner. I mean, obviously, anyone who's struggling to find a job and has been unemployed for a long time, it's very mm -hmm. upsetting and stressful. And I do have a lot of compassion. But to your, your point, Lee, I, I think it does speak to the new demands on workers who have been accustomed to being corporate stars. And suddenly they're being asked to do more, do more with less, refresh their skill set. And yeah. some people take on that mantle. You know, other people struggle with that. And I think that's the new reality. Yeah, the bars higher. I did want to kind of circle back to the beginning story, which is, now see, I love this. I'm going back and forth on empathy. First, it's like I'm pro Roland, then I'm like, Roland, what are you crying about? Here's the thing, though. Leia, to your point, Roland's nervous at the end. He's frustrated. But if you really think about it, he's frustrated because some strange performance art on LinkedIn didn't work. Mm. Like Matt, you said early yeah. on, like, did you email people? Right. Did you cold email anybody? Did you hit? Yeah. Did you hit yeah. the pavement? Have you like taken I did, anyone Roland? for coffee? Yeah. Are yeah. you working, Roland? Hey, really quick! If you've enjoyed and benefited from listening to the Lonely Office, they love please, this show. They don't just enjoy it; they Aaron, love it, Matt. I'm sorry, oh, sorry, dude, sorry. Okay, I gotta finish this up. Please leave us a five star rating and review. It really helps us make more episodes. You know, I think I mentioned this personal story in a previous episode, but during the Great Financial Crisis, I had a friend of mine in finance 
who got laid off. And I think LinkedIn was around, but it certainly wasn't as networked as it was back then, circa whatever, 2007. Yeah, it he, was around. He went out onto Wacker Drive in downtown Chicago and held a picket or like a sign basically what? saying, you know, hire me, put some bullets on that sign. And he actually got a few leads out of that. that and it just speaks to your huh. story of like, the extent that sometimes you have to go to Aaron early digital. Aaron likes the theatrical it nature. Feels of it feels very 80s movie. I think that's... It feels very, you know, it feels like Secret of My yes! Success with Michael yes. J. Fox going above and beyond. Right. Circling back, though, there are real numbers to say, okay, we know it's not just discomfort, right? Like, clearly six months in the cold, Matt, that's a long time. Roland needs to start doing something different or the circumstances need to change. Right. Well, it's not only six months in the cold. In many cases, for a lot of these individuals, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars of tuition debt, right? So what's intriguing yeah. about this like cohort of graduate school students, it seems to me it's a warning shot for the graduate schools. Like the whole premise and promise of a graduate school is to increase employment opportunities, right? You're in the workforce usually, and you elect to spend a good amount of money, tuition money, to sign up for a degree of some sort, a secondary degree. And so the fact that now this cohort in particular is having a difficult time getting out opportunities more so than others, that's really a warning shot. And I think is a, probably a side of concern for these graduate school students. And just speaking to this, here's a thread. The topic is insanely frustrated with this job market. I graduated from my MBA program over six months ago, one of the most prestigious in the country with five years of work experience before getting into MBA. I have now applied to nearly 700 jobs since February, gotten 40 referrals, done 50 plus individual coffee chats, you can't point your fingers at this individual for not for not hustling can't say he's and have not worked multiple times harder paper. than I have in any other job hunt in my life. I got practically nothing back, mostly blanket rejection emails, just a few first round interviews to which the feedback has been, you did great, but your experience did not match the role well enough. And so this is just one of the threads of many of these. I'll just read one more here just so we have on record of these like MBA students. I'm basically in the same boat fresh graduate degree, top of class, hundreds of applications, rounds of interviews, only to be ghosted by the generic email. We've decided to go in another direction, yada, yada. Scary how people are still asking if we're heading towards a recession. Aaron, uh, tell me if this is the case. One of the theories that I've heard is that because companies are very aware that a recession might be coming and have been gearing up toward that, they're just more reluctant to hire unless it's the perfect person. They're not in a rush to fill them the, they, the way they were in, say, 2021. A couple of points I'd make. First, specialized degree holders, they have a more specialized skill set that are more of a specialized match. It's just harder in general for people with advanced degrees to find jobs because they just can't fill any job. It has to be the right job for them. But you're right, in this economic environment, you think that right now we are about two years post interest rate hikes, a year after the Silicon Valley bank collapse. Most estimates from economists about the lagged effect of interest rates in the economy are about a year. So this is about the time we should start to see the effect of interest rates bite. Interest rates are a lot of things to economists, but one thing they are is the cost of risk. And companies are less willing to take risks right now. And when companies do take risks, that means they hire, they buy equipment, they invest, and less of that is happening right now by design. And so risk-sensitive industries are more reluctant to do all of that stuff right now. So there is that reality that is true. Much more eloquently said. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as I said, initially, it's not everyone right now. It's knowledge workers, it's advanced degree holders, it is people with vocational training. If you're working in healthcare, law enforcement is another source of growth right now those sectors are still hiring aggressively. This may be wildly inappropriate, but there was a Chris Rock, I don't know, like comedy routine he did about how white people just struggle when they're poor because they're like, but I'm white. How could this be happening to me? Is it a little bit like that where you have these knowledge workers or people with advanced degrees that are like, oh, I shouldn't be the one who doesn't, but it's me. Like I got an MBA at Wharton. So we talked a lot about on the show about this sort of like existential workplace anxiety. And that's a term you even used yourself, guarantee, yeah. <laughs> of the kind of the knowledge worker, the desk worker, and yeah. how much it mimics, in fact, the anxiety of the manufacturing workers, right? In the late 90s yeah. and early 2000s when NAFTA was outsourcing jobs and you know automation in a lot of the factory lines. And what's interesting here is, yeah, it kind of feels similar where 
these white collar knowledge workers feel this anxiety. It's real. Whereas some of the, let's call it blue collar or at least field manufacturing workers are kind of looking like, well, you're welcome to the club. I mean, this is the state of affairs. This is natural progress. It's just, it's finally hitting you now. It seems like the forces of automation and technology have finally come home to roost for them. In the early 2000s, there was this angst among manufacturing workers that with, with trade globalization, with automation, that was a real kind of force that shaped a lot of industries in the United States in the early 2000s. And economists, I think we were quick to say, well, that's part of change and just kind of adapt to learn new skills and retrain and find you know, a new job. How hard is it to retrain? And something I think that angst is what a lot of knowledge workers are feeling right now after being told that they were incredibly productive and incredibly valuable for decades. What does it look like to actually have to learn new skills and retrain? What kind of sacrifices am I going to have to make in terms of my lifestyle expectations? And I think that's just kind of beginning to internalize. The word retraining yeah. is a word. It's a term that every manufacturing blue class American has been familiar with the better part of a decade or two. Yeah. And now that term is being bandied about for the white collar class. And it's just, it's shocking them. Yeah. Become an AI expert, even though you studied something different, right? One factor we can't forget is student debt. You know, Leah, for me, when I was working in the activism scene around student debt awareness, many of those folks were all college graduates and many of them from economically disadvantaged backgrounds. So I would say across all those lines, there's people facing this specter of like, wait a second, not only did I get crazy into student debt as it's sort of ballooned over the last decades, being, I think, you know, the second highest form of debt in the country next to credit card debt at over $1 trillion. But on top of that, oh shit, I've been out in the cold for six months. Can we at least consider student debt a factor and how people are sort of rearranging their perspective here and trying to attack the job market? No doubt student debt plays into what people feel like they need to maintain a quality of life. We talked about how this isn't a recession. And one of the challenges, one of the complexities right now is that recessions allow us to do a lot of stuff. They allow interest rates to come down, allow government oh. to spend more money. They allow things like debt moratorium or temporary debt moratoriums, the fact that we're not in this broad-based recessions takes a lot of those normal responses that ease people's lives during recessions off the mm. table. So that's very telling. We talk a lot about on this show and on previous episodes about work-life balance consideration for a lot of the knowledge professionals and how the calculus has completely changed for many of us. I think all three of us have talked about this phenomenon. I know I have, where our parents didn't really have the luxury of spending much time with us because they were, in many cases, on call at work or burning Latch the midnight kids, oil right, or just Matt? trying to get Latch that paycheck. Kids. Yeah, It's a very clear and stark difference between the amount of time I spend with my kids and my father, and I don't hold it against them at all. It's just a function mm. of kind of work and economic opportunity. I feel in the last three, four years, particularly with this new hybrid remote situation, the knowledge professional class have gotten very comfortable, particularly those who are trying to spend more time with their kids, with this new calculus. How much now will that have to change as the economic conditions get a little worse, job opportunities a little hard to get to? Will they, will we have to give up on some of that? That post we even read at the top, the very first thread kind of speaks to this. I mean, the line they used was, I've been working from home for the last six years. The thought of going back to an office and losing 10 plus hours per yeah. week to my commute and getting dressed for work is kind of heartbreaking. Time with the family. I, yeah. How much of this is like, we're going to have to give in on some of these, what we thought were earned privileges, I don't know, or are right at this point, but maybe they're not, they're benefits. Yeah. 2021 and 2022 and the very tight labor market of, of those years, I think set a new high watermark for what a generation of workers believed they should expect from work. And I think there are legitimate questions about whether or not that high benchmark of 2021 and 2022, we will ever get back to that. What a lot of economists talk about as a normalization in the economy, it's going back to where it was, you hear that kind of phrasing a lot, that it's a normalization from the pandemic era sugar high in the economy. For most people, for a lot of people, normalization feels like a loss of status. I'm really curious to see if the labor class in this case, if the remote worker is going to budge, right? I think it's one thing going back to a lower salary or a different set of fringe benefits that the company may or may not be able to provide. But this work-life balance quotient, it's really fundamental. And I think people got a taste of it. And I really wonder whether we're not going, going back, back man. Um, <laughs> right. And so, yeah, I know there's really no answer to that. Time will tell. 
But that particular component really hits on a pulse that goes beyond just the economy and livelihood. Perhaps this is a too technical in the weeds economist point, but when most economists measure the price of goods and track prices over time, we adjust for quality. When you buy a bag of chips and we measure the inflation for chips, we adjust for if it's a big bag of chips or a small bag of chips, if there's fewer chips in the bag, we don't do that for wages. We don't adjust for the quality of work. When we say hmm. wages are going up 3% or going up 5%. That's a great point. We don't, yeah. we don't say this is a quality adjusted, constant quality wage index. And mm -hmm. I think Glassdoor data allow us to look a little bit at that and say like, okay, wages may look like they're going up 5% above inflation, but what is the quality of life behind that wage? Is it constant as well? And that's so interesting. If wages have gone up, but you're working 80 hours a week. Are you just better off? Yeah. Okay. Well, Aaron Terrazas, thank you for joining us thank today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Clarifying a lot, bringing some authoritative source into the show to back up some of what we say glibly. I think yeah, our listeners will appreciate We usually just have to trust that Matt's saying something, you know. <laughs> That he's researched, so it's nice. But I actually to have know what I'm talking about. Thank you for validating about. my yeah. instincts. There you go. To be right, so thank you very much. <laughs> Always fun. Thanks for jumping on. One thing I didn't think about, and I should yeah. have mentioned this to him, Roland in his story, does he even consider unemployment? Do you know what I'm saying? Like at that point, we're like right. six months in. He clearly went through the whole exercise of doing the LinkedIn sad note, the thing that worked in 2021. Then he tried it again. It doesn't work. I think he was afraid of becoming a 99er. You guys know know what a 99er no, is? No, a 99er. So and I think TikTok has popularized or resurfaced this term 99er that was very popular initially brought to, to people's attention in 2008 and 11 mm. during the great financial crisis. There was basically legislation that was passed, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act in 2009, that put a maximum of 99 weeks of unemployment insurance benefits. And so apparently there were 7 million people at that time who were affected basically wow. maxed out their unemployment insurance benefits. And so becoming a 99er is like the worst case scenario, right? Where not yeah. only are you out in the cold for, I mean, at that point, it's almost like just short wow. of two years, but you run out of any employment insurance and you become dubbed a 99er. 2008, right? Yeah. I was on unemployment for about three months around that time, transitioning from New York back to Cleveland. Things were rough, man. I've talked about this on the show. Like when I moved back, I got kind of back on my feet. But those three months were, they were cold. And I didn't even realize at the time that, that they put a cap on that or else I would have been even more st stressed out. Yeah. So I'm glad I didn't know. Are there any similar stories or personal stories of us perceiving this change in market that Roland has perceived or experienced? Well, I have a good friend who's been job hunting for months now. And who's like mm. amazing resume. Are they MBA? Great interview. No. We have to ask that now every time. That comes up. <laughs> <laughs> this person is not an MBA and it looks like they might have finally found that perfect role, which is what I do tell people. I'm always like, you only need that one perfect set of interviews and that one job offer, really. Right. But it does seem to be taking longer to find the perfect match. Yeah, I have a few friends, all of whom definitely fall within that category of racking up graduate degrees, kind of like trophies, diplomas on the wall. And, you know, I'm not denigrating them or anything like that. I've always had a thing where, you know, if you're pursuing a graduate degree, you should pursue it towards an end. Matt, you're not going to have any friends once you're <laughs> done with this <laughs> but spiel. I find it a little, little ironic now that they, yeah, like those are the exact kind of class or cohort of, of workers right now that are experiencing the most difficulty. Yeah getting a job are the ones who got some of those secondary degrees. You know, this might sound counterintuitive, but I actually think one of the reasons four years ago why I went off on my own as an entrepreneur was actually because of the frustration of what people are dealing with right now for traditional employment. I have always felt at risk. I always, no matter how they talked about how we're family, how, and you know, hmm. you guys, we joke about it, but I had a couple of rough goes at it coming out of 2008. I got fired multiple times, but it was more just like downsizing budget. So I always was on unsteady ground after graduation. I always felt like I was planning for the next job at the job I was at. Never could really settle in. I always was like waiting for the off ramp and building networks so that I could leave. I didn't want to live like that. And so when I got an opportunity to go out on my own, actually, it's really yeah. helped alleviate a lot of that anxiety. Mm -hmm. So actually for me, my story was the pivot into entrepreneurship wasn't just because it was an opportunity. So I could avoid the sort of stress of the traditional job market. The other part of Roland's story, we only touched briefly. These other kind of 
factors that the economists and pundits don't know? Are they tailwinds or headwinds for the job searcher? And specifically, we're talking about AI. We've mentioned a number of episodes, AI coming for creatives, and we've talked about this. It's a recurring theme, as it should be, because it's very much on the mind of the knowledge professional. But what I'm hearing, and I think Aaron Tarazis mentioned a bit of this when we had him on, is that, yes, it's going to have a short-term impact, perhaps, on some of the employment opportunities for the knowledge worker. But in the long term, at net, it should create more jobs. And that logic goes something like this, which I don't know if I really buy. It goes that, like, if you look at the way the advent of the internet unfolded, the at net it actually allowed more types of jobs and more types of roles for the economy. In that sense, the internet was a good thing for the labor market and for people seeking jobs. The problem I see with that analogy is we can see really directly how AI can literally perform, in some cases, outperform our knowledge-based skills. Yeah. And, you know, kind of in the same way the internet made jobs like booking agents and floor sales representatives and other intermediaries just redundant. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the analogy that comes to our mind where it's like, okay, yeah, AI can make us completely redundant. And I think that's the way most knowledge professionals see it. If you're a knowledge worker, one way to look at it though is like, instead of thinking about being obsolete, use that shit to your advantage. Aaron just talked about how employers are looking to save money and save time and they're risk averse. So use that tool to be more efficient, to do things quicker and to save money. And that could be your calling card. I think it's about adaptation. And I think that's what Roland needs to do. Honestly, that's where he's at right now, right? We have no choice. Yeah, it is adaptation. Another form of adaptation is maybe you don't get the grad school degree. Right? Oh, Take that, that money. Shots fired, shots fired. Matt <laughs> never misses. Yeah, never misses um, an opportunity to talk about how stupid grad degrees are. Why don't we end with, if you do find yourself unemployed for a long stint, how do you deal with the long work gaps in cases where the job search runs long? I'll just kick off with one of the threads. With weaponizing work gaps means we push back by lying. They don't get to have it both ways. Here's what you do. You register a consultancy as a single member LLC with your state. Give it a name. Once registered, place that employer in your gap. I love it. So going as far as creating kind of a, a faux LLC so that if it's looked up, it's legit, right? It has an EIN number and place it on your LinkedIn to address gap. But this is something that's coming up more and more as these candidates are in the cold longer and longer. What do they resort to framing the best picture for employers? And I can imagine the applicant tracking systems penalizing you if it sees this gap. And I know a lot of people take a creative approach and do a coding course or project management course, especially if you are looking to change career paths somewhat don't want to spend all of the money on a graduate degree. One of my relatives just did one for coding and then was able to find a coding web security job, but within law enforcement. So talking about those industries that are hiring that aren't the traditional, like I'm going to go work at a tech company. Right. But yeah. So retraining. It's worked out. That's retraining. Yeah. But it's also a way to sort of fill in a gap in a resume. The question obviously asked in that case is what happens when the engineers have to retrain themselves now as... The AI gets smarter in that regard too. But I think your point is taken is like invest in yourself, find a program, yeah. get credentialed. I have a great suggestion and a great tactic. I don't even charge you for it. You ready for it? Did you say that that person created a fake LLC to show that they worked for it? Yeah. That's a total flip side of what I would do. First, why don't you just create the LLC and start doing work? and then say that you worked at a consultancy. What I love about that approach is like all the trouble to create the LLC and I just sit back just to show I don't have a job gap. Hey, you made it. Thanks for tuning into The Lonely Office. If you like what you heard, follow us on all major podcast platforms so you don't miss an episode and make sure and tap five stars and leave a review. I know everyone says it, but it actually helps others like you discover the show. Remember, the topics you hear us talk about on the show are sourced from Glassdoor communities where professionals are having candid conversations about their careers anonymously with others in their industry. To be part of that conversation, download the Glassdoor app. And when you're in the app, make sure and join the Lonely Office Bowl. That's where we are. When you're there, you can suggest a topic idea or an episode idea, or you can make it more formal and email us at thelonelyoffice at glassdoor.com. We'll catch you next time.